Joanna approached me and asked just to give a quick uh, my thoughts on, on 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 what I think the benefits of a people's assembly or my what I like to call it a tetiriti based people's assembly is moving forward. And um, you know, at first it was where do you start? But um, and and we're going to hear a lot in depth from our two main speakers. But uh, the one thing that I really wanted to focus on. And we, I mean, you've seen it. I've seen it in pockets with the aftermath of Cyclone Gabriel up north, um, with people coming together. So, a big part, I believe, at a fundamental level, when it comes to people's assemblies, is its ability to bring people together. Um, I think that's foundational in it. I think you can't have one without the other, because the whole idea is you're bringing all forms of community to, into one place to. Um, make a decision. And and I think we can all probably recognise that when we're talking about climate crisis, the need for us to come co together collectively and move together as one is probably the most important thing, whether we're, whether we're talking about a just transition or even just the right decisions for, for everybody um, uh, in the sense yes, of uh, the rebuild up north. I think the most important thing is, and Joanna just touched on it, but is that is that we have that uh, community collective decision making moving forward, and um, yeah, I totally agree that this is that that the process of people's assemblies or citizens' assemblies or territory based people's assemblies um, holds that fundamentally. So it'd be awesome to see that brought forward in that discussion, but also in the broader climate discussion everywhere and how that can help us move along and getting what we need faster uh, with more integrity and, 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 um, and to be honest, in a more realistic action-based way, putting, putting the facts and, 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 and the truth of it in front of all people so they can make a educated choice rather than what we have now where we just listen to what we listen to and believe what we believe. So yeah. Um, so I'm a bit thrown off because I'm talking to a phone at the moment, but I'll, I'll leave it there. And um, I'm not sure, Joanne, if you wanted me to introduce the speakers or if that's back to you. I, I'll, I'll go ahead with that. But before I thank you, Tewehi, before I do that, I'll say a couple of words about, about process. Uh, if you're not muted, and I think just about everyone is, um, but but main, maintain your muting through the meeting uh, and, until you, you wish to speak. Um, and uh, you will have noticed that we're recording this meeting. If by any chance you don't want your face to feature on the recording, just uh, take your video off. And when we come to questions, and we, we want to spend a good deal of time on questions, I'm hoping for a, a lot of comments and participation. And we'll do it with the, uh, the icons um, the icon for, for raising the hand. In, uh, there's a little icon um, at, at the bottom of your screen saying reactions uh, and including the raise hand one like that. Uh, and then you, you are also enabled to lower your hand when you uh, have been addressed with your question. Um, Yes, if possible, don't put your questions in, in the chat um, or any other place, uh, but raise your hand, which is very helpful because with two screens, uh, all of the questions will come onto the first screen and we should be able to see them in order. Okay, so now let me get on to introducing our first speaker, May Miller Dawkins, and I'm really delighted to introduce May and um, very, very pleased that, that May now lives in, in our extended community um, because May ha has accumulated a great deal of expertise and experience in the area that we're addressing. May is a researcher, an advocate and facilitator with over 20 years of experience, I believe May, but... <laughs> I have to accept it's 20 years of experience working in and with social movements, community organizations, international civil society, universities and foundations, 
with a focus on community leadership, corporate accountability, and open government. May is originally from Australia and came to Fakatu Nelson in 2020, where she lives with her partner, two sons, and a dog. Over to May. Kia ora. Thank you, Joanna and Tawehi, for your um, welcoming us into the space um, and into this discussion. Um, and as Joanna said, I'm I'm a relatively new migrant to New Zealand. Um, I'm the descendant of um, convicts and settlers from Ireland and England and Germany who um, came from that hemisphere down to Aotearoa and Australia in the in the 1800s. Um, and recognise that I've I've grown up um, on stolen land, um, and um, and so want to pay pay my respects. Um, as Joanna said, I'm I'm coming to you with a background in thinking and working around participation and power over the past 25 years. So I'm not an expert specifically on citizens or people's assemblies, but I have a kind of deep experience in working with um, groups. Um, internationally around different forms of participation that allow for different kinds of deliberation, decision making um, and power sharing. And so my job today is to, I think, kind of position this particular form and growing practice of people's assemblies in a kind of um, broader context. Um, so where has it come from? And also how is it being used in different places and spaces, um, because I think it gives us some clues for how to think about um, what maybe makes sense here. Um, and I'm really excited to then hear from Callie, um, who's bringing, you know, a deep um, experience of a process that is happening in this country and is grappling with the important um, questions here about um, how to have a, a Te Tariti People's Assembly. So, um, so mine is, is the kind of broader context. Um, so I'm going to share um, some slides if I can find them. Um, wait one second. Tech, tech, tech. Um, so here we go. So, um, so one of the first pieces of context I was going to start with is that there's this kind of what's known as the deliberative wave. So this real increase in the use of deliberative practices, particularly by governments over the past um, 40 plus years. Um, and this is a data set of just OECD countries. So obviously that's limited, um, but also a club which New Zealand is a part of. And you can see this kind of growing, growing, and then significant use of deliberative practices. Now, this isn't just citizens' assemblies. It's a whole raft of deliberative practices. But I think it's really interesting to kind of see that global trend. And I guess that begs the question kind of why and where is this coming from? And I want to point to a few different drivers um, of why there's an increase in this in these kinds of practices. And I think importantly, the first is um, that recognition and learning from First Nations and Indigenous practices of deliberative consideration and decision making, and the kind of recognition of the, I guess, the failures of a lot of, um, uh, you know, kind of settler society, colonial society forms of, of decision making. And you even see that in things like the Talanoa process that the UNFCCC used around, um, around the post-Paris negotiations on how countries would help meet their targets, which came out of Pacific practices, um, particularly from Fiji, around deliberation. So you see it being picked up in a range of different levels. You see it in the kind of growth of restorative justice, practices in different places. And I'd say it's really important that we recognise that these things we're talking about today also grow out of very long traditions um, around deliberative deliberative. I practice. just realised that I need to be part of a, I'm part of a meeting. Uh, so I so can't whoever watch. just realised they won't need to be part of a meeting is also not on mute. <laughs> Um, so I think the other the other strand of this is um, 
is a real desire by many um many people both in government and outside of government to increase the participation, legitimacy and trust in democracy and to address um, issues of equity and inclusiveness that have been um, undermining trust but also undermining the ability of, of governance and government to really deliver inclusively for people. And, and you'll find actually um, that often these practices are prompted in fact by crises and the need to do something new, particularly when the public has lost faith or when, as Joanna was saying, and the way he was saying, there's a need, there's such complexity of the issues that there is a need to, to bring many more people around the table and to have a different way of grappling with the issues. And so a couple of examples of the kind of crisis triggering this these practices are, for example, Ireland, which has become a real leader in this practice, um, its first move on this was really prompted by the global financial crisis and the significant impacts in that country. And then in a more climate relevant way, um, the big national process in France happened after the Gilets Jaunes protests. So the really significant protests around fuel and fuel prices that then saw the kind of President Macron and the political elites realised that they couldn't grapple with this purely um, legislatively or at, at that level. I think the other thing to realise is that often people will talk about citizens' assemblies um, almost as a technical process on its own, but I, I, for me, they're part of a real tradition of activist approaches to providing credible alternatives to building support to raising voices. And so they're you know, other things that have been like um, the climate juries that lots of activist networks were having around the world 15 years ago in which people were giving testimonies of the impacts on them. And that was part of the kind of groundswell around action at that time. For me, there's a direct thread between that and this in terms of the ability to include many more voices and perspectives um, in the debate and decision making about what to do about these complex issues. Um, and lastly, there's a kind of diffusion happening of this practice through international networks. So a movement that I've been part of internationally, um, the Open Government Movement, um, the Open Government Partnership was something that Obama and a number of other heads of state founded um, just over 10 years ago. And there's a kind of, that includes 78 national governments, over 100 local governments at this stage, and co-creating with civil society reforms to make government more participatory, more open, more accountable. Um, and this focus on deliberation has been really rising within that movement. And you'll see many different countries starting to, starting to pick it up and put it into practice. And on that front, this, this is just a kind of a snapshot of some of the commitments that countries and also localities have been making within that open government partnership network around liberation. Um, and you'll see New Zealand is up there. The, the New Zealand government has adopted this commitment around researching deliberative processes for community engagement. And Kelly and I were chatting a bit when we first got on about the fact that um, the work that they are doing is referenced within some of that, but they weren't really a part of shaping it. So it doesn't always, Open Government Partnership doesn't always live up to the, to the values, the, the kind of ambitions of the process itself. But it, this is kind of an interesting way of seeing, I guess, the way in which this is being picked up and, um, and spread in different places. So then I just wanted to talk about kind of a few examples from different places that show how these practices are being used also at different scales. So starting kind of at the global scale, um, in the lead up to COP27, most recent COP, there was actually something called a global assembly. So that focused again on this idea of generating more inclusive voice and involvement um, at the global level. And the kind of orienting question of that was how can humanity address the climate and ecological crisis in a fair and effective way? And they had two parts. So they had a 100-person assembly that was representative of the global population. Um, and they went through the more traditional kind of 
deliberative process of learning about the issues and deliberating collectively and then presenting proposals um, at, sorry, COP26, not COP27, um, getting ahead of myself. And um, the second part was a more distributed action, so more aligned with what I was talking about in terms of activist networks using these processes to raise the issues and expand the inclusion of voices um, that groups ran community assemblies around the world. So that's at the global level that it's being used to try to influence. Then you come down to, to even national processes. So the French process that I mentioned earlier, um, the question in that process was how to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by at least 40% by 2030 in the spirit of social justice. So again, goes to some of those very complex and contentious issues um, that really require a kind of reckoning, a public reckoning and coming to grips with some of the trade-offs. Um, this was a group of 150 and they actually called 255,000 people to find the representative sample and ask them if they'd be willing to be involved and incredibly 70% of people said yes. And so it was then out of that 70% that they brought together the 150. They met, you'll see the kind of timeline, they met a range of times and had quite intensive hearing from different perspectives, different experts, deliberating. Um, and so obviously this is a very resource intensive process done nationally, you know, just calling 255,000 people is pretty resource intensive. So that had a budget of over 5 million euros. Um, and it generated 149 recommendations. Um, President Macron initially said he accepted all but three of them and they would all go into law, but actually only half of them have, have made it into the climate laws. So there's kind of the often the, um, you know, the deliberative process also running up against the political process in different ways. Interestingly, in this case as well, the 150 have actually set up an, an ongoing organisation called the 150 who are now kind of engaging politically, which is also a really interesting kind of set of questions about this group that was in a way set up for its representativeness in a particular process, but now has an identity and a, a sense of ownership over what, what the process generated. So going down more to, you know, lo local areas, cities, um, a bit more, you know, slightly more equivalent, bit larger potentially. Um, so I just want to highlight this assembly that happened in Gdansk, Poland, um, because it was triggered by impacts of flooding. And it was proposed by citizens, actually by, you know, groups kind of like those on the call today. And it was taken up by the mayor who kind of realised we need a we need a broader and deeper engagement around this. I can't just make decisions. Um, it was kind of well publicised. That's a picture in a bus shelter, a very blurry picture. Um, but the interesting thing about this assembly is that the mayor explicitly, prior to the process starting, delegated authority to this group. So said if 80% of the participants can agree on changes that need to be made, they will be accepted. So at the level of city policy and at the level of spending city funds. Yes. Um, and this group identified 16 flood mitigation actions and they and they have made a difference in, in subsequent flooding. Um, I want to also highlight this Brussels Climate Assembly because it only launched this month and what they've done in Brussels is they've set up a process that's permanent and ongoing. So instead of a once-off assembly on a question, they're going to have a series of representative panels over time. Um, and so their idea is both that this body is able to propose recommendations to the city government, but also to monitor them. And a subset, so 25%, 25 people from a prior panel, basically set the agenda for the next panel. Um, so there's a kind of continuity of um, the panels being able to identify the issues that are, that are most important. And then I also want to highlight over um, in Australia, in Victoria, that in 2020, um, the Victorian government passed a new local government act and that required community accountability, a community engagement policy, and importantly, if you see clause G down there, include deliberative engagement practices, which must include and address any matters 
blah, 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 particularly these, these core documents, right? Community vision, council plan, financial plan and asset plan. Those are things that each council in Victoria is meant to do every four years. Um, and so that's a really interesting, so state-wise mandated, legislatively mandated um, deliberative engagement. So this was building on successful processes that had been happening in the state. Um, but of course, there's it's a kind of principles-based regulation. So there wasn't any real guidance as to exactly how they needed to do it, in what form. You know, it wasn't saying they had to do a citizens or a people's assembly. Um, and part of what they've run into is actually issues around capability to support skilled facilitation of deliberative processes, which, you know, not all councils have, and there is a limited number of people who can support that. Um, but there have been evaluation of a number of processes, even in the past couple of years, and one of the things they show, which aligns with research from other places like the UK, where there's a lot of um, citizens' assemblies in the UK, one of the things that assemblies really generate is an increase in trust and engagement of participants that's beyond the assembly itself. So people's kind of belief that, um, that it's worth engaging in political and, you know, in these kinds of debates and that there might actually be action taken tends to increase from participating in them. So that's kind of some practical examples to, to get you thinking about how these might look. And so you'll see from that, there's some kind of key features. Um, one is a clear purpose and question. So um, a group, New Democracy, who do a lot of facilitation of this in Australia and globally, they always recommend a question of no more than 10 words to discuss. So you want something um, kind of challenging, but also direct, you know, not... Um, anything overly complex in its framing. Then you want a representative sample of people in a locality and as we saw from those examples at any scale um, but what you're looking for is to really reflect the, the diversity in different senses of, of, um, of the geographic area. Then importantly time and resources to learn and deliberate and to hear from diverse sources. Um, so that's really at the heart of this, that people have the space um, and access to information and to perspectives to really process that. So it's not, as Tway he said, that you're just reading the stuff that's on your Facebook because of what you've chosen to follow. You know, you're really hearing different voices. And actually, I heard this story last week, um, a colleague who actually went to a training in how to run these. Um, in Victoria because they're kind of trying to train people up now that they've said all councils have to do it. And the interesting thing is that they were running the training kind of as an assembly. And so they had invited in somebody who disagrees with citizens' assemblies as a method of making decisions. And so that was a kind of demonstration of the method in action that you kind of want to hear, you know, different perspectives. Now, part of that, as I was saying, with capability is skilled facilitation. So people who are able to hold the space and hold the process. And I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot from Callie about what that actually takes to do it with integrity. Um, and, and I guess because, you know, in Victoria, part of what they're finding is that you can easily default back to, you know, a, a white paper and a consultation and whoever shows up and we're going to call it deliberation because people read something and they said something. Um, and I guess this is a recognition that that's not it, right? That we're talking about a very different kind of, of engagement. So in the in the kind of classic, um, I guess, form of a citizens assembly, part of what's important is how recommendations coming out of it will be used. Um, and so as we saw in the examples, there can be delegated authority ahead of time, like in Gdansk, or there regardless needs to be a kind of clear process for decisions to be taken to others or implemented. So that could be in some places following referenda. Um, it could be a government response and going into legislative processes, um, but important to know what is the process for consideration. But I'm going to temper that by saying classically, um, when most people are talking about citizen assemblies, they're talking about them actually initiated by government. So, you know, where even say in the Gdansk case where 
citizen groups were asking for it, but then the mayor said yes, um, then the government itself set it out. But I just, I, in my view of it, there's also the form that that operates, is initiated and operates outside of government. That's also what we're going to hear about um, from Cali. And I think that's more in that vein I was talking about in terms of trends where um, activists and social movements and other groups are finding ways of creating the debate they see as needed, the voices that I think need to be heard, the issues that need to be put firmly on the agenda. And just to recognise that that's just a different way of using this process to find the kind of pathway to try to move us closer to the change that we need. So those are kind of dimensions, I guess, to think about when we're thinking about the use of this. Um, and similarly, these can be, you know, standalone. So on that very specific issue and kind of discrete um, or they can be also integrated into other processes. And I guess that also recognises that often it's not the only thing you need, you know, to make decisions on these really deep, complex, potentially contentious, you know, issues, decisions that have real impacts on people's lives. Then often you'll find there might be, you know, an earlier process of engagement or consultation. There might be, um, you know, even to decide what the question is. And then you might also have afterwards a whole lot of processes of, um, you know, consulting on the recommendations more broadly so that there's broader community input. You know, this is certainly not to shut down other ways that a broader set of community can also be involved. And even I think there are ways of thinking about how you, and they did this a bit in the French process, how you open that process up, how you make that transparent, how other people can also listen to the um, different perspectives and expert input or can hear as the process develops how the group is deliberating. So I think can be quite creative in thinking around that. And then just a final piece on some kind of contradictions and considerations. Um, so this is from some research about kind of outcomes of a set of national deliberative processes. And it's kind of highlighting the quote that actually sometimes there are these two hopes or impetuses around assemblies that might also be in some tension. So sometimes it's about better policy because you're taking some of the heat out of it, some of the, you know, especially countries and societies that are dealing with um, growing polarisation. You're trying to find a space in which you can find different kinds of understanding um, and common ground that might lead to different kinds of, in a way, political settlements even. But then there's the other hope, which is, and might be represented more also in some of the processes that happen outside of government, which is that you're actually galvanising a broader shift, you know, that if we need to deeply shift how we think, how we conceive of these issues, what we can imagine about our future and what kind of radical action we might need to take, then that might be quite different to the idea that we'll, we'll come to this kind of, you know, uncontentious common ground. Um, so... That's something to kind of sit with, I think. Um, and I had just these kind of three questions for us all to think about as we think about the relevance in our own work and where we are. So there's how can an assembly integrate its deliberations into the broader debates and processes that shape decision-making on climate change? So thinking about the assembly as a kind of, you know, obviously it is a deeply political act, but there's a way in which you can almost stay myopically focused on the assembly itself rather than trying to make sure that all the, the players who need to be are aware of what's happening and that the ideas that are emerging within the assembly are also moving into other spaces because we know that there needs to be shifts in so many spaces to get the chain, the scale of change that we're going to need. And relatedly, you know, how do they best engage beyond their participants? So that piece of the public engagement or on the political level while balancing that contradiction, the quote po points to. Um, and obviously, how does an assembly realise tetaviti? And how to, how, you know, what actually makes sense in this place here with the history that's here um, around a process of this kind? 
So I'll, I'll leave it there and pass back to Joanna. Excellent. Oh, thank you very much, May. That was an excellent cover coverage of, of the global Sorry, Joanna, you're muted. Gosh, okay. is that right now? Oh, okay. Sorry. Well, you you didn't hear my thanks to you, May, for for superb coverage of the global context. Thank you so much. Um, now we turn to Kelly, um, bringing it back close to home in Aotearoa, and Kelly O'Neill trained in architecture and went on to found her own company, which specialized in participatory design of community spaces. She's developed practices of collaboration with local people and experts across industries and tackles the, the uh, look, looks for solving the most problems using the fewest resources. In 2019, Kelly shifted her participatory passions towards political activism, particularly advocating for Te Tūriti based deliberative democracy to address the climate, social, biodiversity, and sustainability crises. She's a founding member of Te Reo o Ngā Tangata, People Speak, and is considered a leading thinker on collaborative governance. She's working with Ngāti Toa Rangatira to develop new community govern governance structures for Porirua. So, Kelly, looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Kia ora, Joanna, and kia ora, May and Tuihi as well for your, um, your great contributions. That's so cool. That intro makes me feel... Um, yeah, feels a little bit too professional for for how I feel. I sometimes feel like I'm um, just um, a professional of not knowing what's going to happen and being okay with that. <laughs> just keep going anyway. Um, yeah, so I just very quickly introduce myself. Um, I might yeah, Kelly. My name is Kelly O'Neill, and I grew up in Dunedin. Um, after moving here when I was five with my parents from the UK and um, yeah my ancestry is largely Irish and um, quite a few different European countries but I um, yeah just feel so incredibly lucky to have been um, able to grow up here and yeah, pay my respects to the mana whenua of the land and um, yeah I'm really uh, enjoying and um, grappling with this work these days. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here and to, to talk to you all a little bit about this. And um, yeah, I'll sort of, I'll hopefully just cruise through a few slides as well and um, hopefully give you a bit of information that you're looking for, but importantly, make time for questions. Um, yeah, so We'll see how it goes. And I, I feel like my presentation might be a little bit scatterbrained. I've just actually come back from Napier helping a friend of mine up there. And so it's very, um, very tangible <laughs> for me right now, this need for, um, for action and, um, you know, the collectivism that we see out coming out of disasters. It is beautiful and inspiring. And it also has a dark side, which is the people who are already in desperation because of the inequality in our society, they are pushed to even more desperate extremes. And, and so it, it seems like, you know, there's a lot of um, looting and, and um, disrespecting other people's needs that seems to be happening. And I feel fairly sure it's because we've already let these people down you know and I think just the scale I don't, I don't think that I would be um yeah I, f I feel like you're probably all here for um with the shared belief that we need to take really um drastic action on on climate and um it, it just it feels like um the scale of the emergency is too large for us to respond in the aftermath like we really have to push for this collectivization to happen as soon as possible because um, otherwise we will 
yeah we will take the turn of history which leads to um which 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 is what we've seen happen in history when resources are depleted humans tend to not get along so well and we, we really have to front foot that and and um whenever I kind of get into a moral quandary about what the hell I should be doing to try and help I kind of always come back to this idea of of working with mana whenua um in order to bring about some kind of collective decision making um I personally am not sure what else to do except I do really enjoy joining Tuihi on our group to Wakahorua which is a um a, a tangata whenua led direct action climate group so yeah so um, yeah a little bit of a rambly introduction I'll try not to ramble too much the rest of the time <laughs> and I'm going to share a screen with you hopefully now I'm working yeah so oops so this is our system a little a little slideshow to show where we are we're up to at the moment so um I'm here today representing um, the project that I'm part of. I'm part of the group Te Reo Nga Tangata and we're working with Te, te Runanga o Toa Rangatira or um, the people of Ngati Toa, which um, there may be someone on the call tonight, I'm, I'm not sure, but um, we were unable, unfortunately, Ngati Toa were unable to join us um, to represent this project tonight. So I thought I would share this pepeha of theirs um, as an introduction. And we, the people speak, were very fortunate to meet um, with Ngāti Toa at the end of 2020, and that was when we formed our working relationship. So we've been um, working on this together for a couple of years. And before that, um, Te Reo Ngā Tangata came after a, um, a conference on climate, which I know that Joanna was at. It was called, I think it was called the Conference on Climate, but it was specifically about using citizens' assemblies to address climate change. And out of that came a, um, a voluntary working group to look at what it would, to explore what Te Tiriti based citizens' assemblies in Aotearoa would look like. And um, yeah, that's where our group came from. And it really is, um, a, a, yeah, it's a, I think, and I think we'll come back to this over these slides, is that we have a really unique opportunity in Aotearoa to do something different and um, it's one of the things that I'm really excited about here so the the people speak Te Reo Nga Tangata spent the first year or so before meeting with Ngāti Toa just advocating for the idea and talking to councils and talking with the open government partnership um, that May was talking about and yes we had to approach <laughs> we've, we've, we haven't heard anything back from them specifically um, and everybody, the experience was that everybody said, yep, great idea, beautiful, no one's going to want to fund it, basically, like, there's no, um, we can't, we can't just do that, and so we um, were pretty determined that we were going to try and do it ourselves, and then after meeting with Ngāti Tuarangatira, we've been able to form that collaboration, and we've received a small amount of funding, um, confusing image, this is just, as jo Joanna mentioned, my background is in architecture, so this is one of our participatory, this is actually really far along on a participatory um, project with for community space. And the things that I really, really learned there is that, um, you know, consensus is real. If you give people the opportunity to understand each other, you can reach these agreements, which it are, you know, we, we're just not used to because we're so familiar with the hierarchical model we're not used to those consensuses and when they happen and when they unfold um they can be really beautiful and meaningful and like may was saying you know people become more political when they have an engagement process like this and really with space what you see is people having this um sense of belonging and purpose around community facilities and therefore using them more and their kids feel more at home there and just yeah it was really really beautiful and the, the other thing that i also learned in these situations is that often in a community setting I'm sure you've all experienced it sometimes one percent of the people involved will take up you know an extreme a, a, a disproportionate amount of the resources allocated to the project just bringing along individual people and I, I think this is something that really fatigues um, the community sector in general 
And I personally believe that with more deliberative processes, we will actually just become more adept at the these models of consensus and the idea of if there's 150 people who think this way and you think something different, you know, you're gonna you're gonna start to realize that your one against 150 actually isn't that important. But the way that we act at the moment is that the loudest speaker is um is the one who gets heard. Uh yeah, and and my career in participatory architecture was really um drawn to a close by something that I had been working on in the background the whole as an activist the whole time which is the climate crisis and I just kind of got to a point with the building industry where I felt there was nothing left to do apart from to take political action and um you know like we I I actually am starting to question whether we even live in a democracy like I don't know I what the conditions of using that word are but I feel like whatever democracy we're in there are threads left that we need to cling on to I think that democracy is fundamentally um incompatible with capitalism <laughs> for example the way that we have let free market capitalism um happen has meant that there is no way to represent the people without it being impacted by uh, lobbyists and um just the market as it exists is um is is something that has become more of a powerful voice than um, the community, which is, I think we all know that. And even even things like philanthropy, like I believe we have to work in collaboration with the philanthropic sector, but for us to allow wealth to accumulate into these pockets, which are then allowed to be distributed by these elite wealthy people, that also I think is fundamentally undemocratic. So we really need to um, to develop some new processes fast. And yeah, like I said before, I think we're in a really unique opportunity. We have a unique opportunity here because we have Te Tiri Te Waitangi. And um, I just wanted to put these quotes up here for you to have a quick look at this, just to give a little bit of context about what Te Tiri Te means. The first one is from Te Papa Teraki, which was the big Waitangi Tribunal um, hearing on Te Tiriti itself, um, which establishes that He Whakaputanga, although not explicitly mentioned in Te Tiriti, is the founding document before Te Tiriti, so we need to understand them together. Um, and also that one from, um, from Judge Jury, which kind of gives us a sense and and so another little bit of background about me is I've been studying at Tuananga Orokawa, studying Māori laws and philosophy and I think one of the things that has become really startlingly clear to me over my um, time there which I yeah just feel so incredibly grateful for is that there was never this this the the government that we have now was never consented <laughs> it was not it's an illegitimate government it was not um agreed so te tiriti, when we say we want to do something te tiriti based we actually have a pretty blank slate because it's it's both positive and a negative right we've got this blank slate to work with and at the same time we've got a government who's trying to say anything that you do you know like we get these small wins through doing it through the government or what um, Moana Jackson has referred to as incrementalism, you know, the, the stasis of having to try and achieve these goals of, um, of transforming governance of Aotearoa whilst it is all being governed by the Crown. There's a kind of contradiction there where you're trying to break through something by using the very thing that is actually broken and um, so that's that's a that's a tricky thing that we need to that we've been working on with our treaty partners to try and figure out how to do this with the existing systems, but also not ask permission and not to be rolled over by what already exists. Um, I have some questions around that, but I'll keep going if I can get my slides to work. We go. So I just wanted to put this one up because um, when we talk about honouring te tiriti or te tiriti based work, um, there's this document which some of you may be familiar with, the report of Matakimai Aotearoa, 
which was um, commissioned by the Iwi Chairs Forum and where they did um, years of extensive research and deliberative assemblies, hui on marae, all over the show. They had over 252 hui all over New Zealand, including, um, and that was just the adults. And then there was an entire rangatahi section. And so there's a, a huge amount of work that has already been done to look at what um, the future of Aotearoa governance could look like from a Māori perspective. Um, and this is just one on the right there. There's just one of the models which um, Mateki Mai has come up with, um, but it's quite a, so one of the things that is, um, present in all of the models or all but one actually is this idea of a relational sphere. So there's um so there's sovereignty, Māori sovereignty, crown governance, and then a relational sphere where we make decisions together and where we have these and, and we sort of see this work that we're doing with the Porirua, um Assembly in Porirua as being in this relational sphere. So it's where the Kawana Tanga sphere and the Tangata Whenua sphere are um are coming together. Um yeah, as May was talking about, there's been there's a lot of precedence. If we're looking strictly at citizens assemblies, there's a lot of precedence for us to learn from um, and to learn not to do from as well, I would suggest in some cases. Um, as we've learned with lots of problem, you know, lots of our issues around colonization and colonial capitalism and patriarchy and you know like all of these things that are really driving um these poly crises across the world new zealand has adopted um a lot of them and um one of our strengths really is going to be our um is our connection to the land here and there's nowhere better there's the, the best um there's an entire world of that in tiao maori so yeah we we we're really lucky there um, you'll see on this slideshow that or on the slide that there are quite a few examples of Indigenous Peoples Assemblies, which, um, as May was saying, has been a really big influence, and, and that's been a really big influence for us as well, because, um, well, specifically in Porirua, there's a really large Pacifica community and has been since the 60s, and um, there's some really amazing kind of conversations happening between the mana whenua and the Pacifica leaders about the um, Pacific modes of deliberation and decision making, and and how that can begin to um, how that can be supported to in Aotearoa as well. Um, and then, so this is sort of a breakdown of how we've been talking to people um, generally about what an assembly is. It's um. It's a bit messy. I actually couldn't find the latest version of this when I was putting this together, unfortunately. You might be able to hear my dog just having a little scratch there. Um, so we, as, yeah, this is really just a communication tool as much, tool as, much as anything because we are in the process of co-designing the entire um, system that we've come up with, um, with Ngāti Toa, with the Pacifica, with all of um, the community leaders. Um, and so this, yeah, this has been a communication tool to enable us to have co-design conversations about um, what this thing could look like and how it's going to be different in Porirua. Um, and yeah, this, so this, you won't be able to read this. This is very small. I probably need a slide in the middle there, just showing some of the hui that we've had already. So in, we've, in Porirua, we've had three big hui to date. Um, in the first one, we brought together a um, about 40 community leaders. Um, maybe that was slightly smaller, actually. And, and th these are the main hui. Like, there have been a whole lot of um, smaller hui that have happened and that have been feeding into this as well. And we've tried to capture as much information from these hui as possible. And then we go through um, and collate people's comments and um, try to determine how which are the most important things based on the number of times that they have been mentioned um, and sort of come up with a who, how, why, what, where, so that we can continue talking to each other about what this project is. So it's kind of like a moving a moving target that gets fed into at each of the hui. Um, and I think I need to do this one first, actually, because I haven't explained yet where we're up to in terms of structure. 
Um, so one of the things that came out of the first big hui that we held was the idea of a, um, a, a talanoa, or that's the working titles we have been using. You can see there talanoa and then wānanga for the Citizens' Assembly. And the idea of the talanoa came from the Pacifica leaders and they kind of explained a bit to us about how representative democracy works um, on the islands where community leaders will represent their community in these open discussion forums. And um, it's a place to be very honest and open um, and to listen and learn and stay connected to know what's happening um, around. And, and so we sort of thought, well, this is a, and this is a beautiful idea to work with in terms of um, having a kind of governance body for a citizens assembly in a way, but that's not its only function because it's a standing forum of community leaders where they will regularly be um, discussing together and coming to agreements about what they are going to um, be recommending and to influence their own decisions as well as the decisions of um, those people who are in charge and tasked with with kind of bigger decisions. Excuse me. <coughs> um, and this talanoa of community leaders, this includes the Porirua City Council. Um, and they have been they have been brought along with this project the whole time and they are they're really interested in it. Um, and yeah, we sort of feel like they that where this Talanoa idea is really, really strong is that it um, doesn't discriminate against community leaders. So it's a place to have a really a real diversity of leadership and that the council leaders sit within that as well, not all of them, but some of them. And so they are part of that process of consensus. And as these um, ideas are kind of being teased out in the Talanoa, the, the government, the council is being brought along the whole time. And um, we kind of feel that if there's both a citizens assembly, so that um, representative selection of people who are going to do the deep dive into these issues and give recommendations back to Talanoa and they're working on consensus or large majority and then you also have the Talanoa which is receiving these reports and then making its own decisions about what it's going to um, recommend then you have a really strong united voice and it's going to be um, really really difficult for the council to say oh well, we're not going to do that um, at least not without damaging their reputation or their ability to get um, votes which is currently you know the thing that current currently drives um, a lot of what council is a sort of how people are forced to make decisions within those institutions um, so, so yeah, so this is kind of just a working diagram. It's ver yeah, very early diagram of what we're going to try and communicate back to people. So at the moment, we're at this stage where we are just having internal discussions about how exactly we're going to do that, because it does need to be, um, as with all participatory design, you know, it needs to be very accessible and it needs to, in this case, communicate quite a lot of information and have a, a way for people to feed back into this process as we develop what this um what this citizens assembly looks like so so we're not where with the the talanoa now has been established and it's kind of it's its wheels are turning and um and so we need to start saying okay well what is this assembly going to look like and similar to some of the um the forums that May was showing we are um, considering both of these assemblies to be ongoing, to be permanent fixtures in Porirua. So the Talanoa will be regular, um, a an ongoing quarterly hui of community leaders and the um, assembly of all of the people, a selection of people from Porirua that will happen as needed, or maybe it will be set up regularly because there's quite a few issues that we could work through for the first sort of five years. Not entirely sure how that's going to work yet. So yeah, coming back to what I was 
saying at the beginning that I'm really um my job is to is to be comfortable with not knowing what's going to happen and to encourage people to feed into this process so we can make something that is really um that is that people can genuinely use you know like the more information from the people in the community that we can get into these early stages of forming these projects the more useful the end outcome will be uh i hope yeah and, and i just wanted to put this picture of to where he's one of two his protests um up here because and similarly to to um the nelson climate forum bringing this discussion together a big part of this is is raising awareness that there is a different way I was going to try and look up there was a, an Ursula Le Guin quote that I love I can't remember it um I forgot to look it up before this hui but it's it's sort of like you know people one of this one of the really big pushbacks that I get from people is basically a, a lack of belief that we're capable of change and um, yeah, there's this Ursula Le Guin quote, which is basically like we we worshipped kings and prophets. It was only 200 years ago, you know. Like if we can't imagine the end of capitalism, we're not being very um, imaginative. So yeah, definitely a bit of a, a roundabout story. Um, I'm not sure if yeah, maybe I'll just leave it there, and and hopefully um, there are some questions that might more useful um, thank oh i better right uh thank you very much kelly um that was i found that a very interesting overview of um the, the process that's that's unfolding as we speak in in porirua uh and and i i'm sure that that we all will follow it with great interest as it as it Develops. So thank you so much. Um, now it's over to everyone. Um, just reminding you to use the reactions icon uh, to put up your hand. And um, don't, uh, you, you may be new to this area, uh, so don't hesitate to, to ask basic questions. Uh, if you have have them, uh, as well as those those who have been reading about it for a while may may want to ask questions at a different level. But no no question is too simple or too basic, um, and uh, we're eager eager for discussion from you all. <clears throat> Perhaps while people are gathering their thoughts. I'll, I'll address a, a question to Kelly, um, and that uh, ha has to do with the, uh, the direction that things are going in terms of moving towards the first Wananga or Citizens Assembly. Um, is, is there any uh, developing idea of what that question might be for the first Um, no, not at this stage is the kind of short answer. I guess um, it will that will be one of the things that we'll be workshopping with the community as we go into the community to talk about the fact that a citizens assembly or a climate assembly is going to happen. Um, we do use a broad idea, the example that I use um, of what, because, you know, it's a very overwhelming, it's a big subject. Um, so the 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 one that I the example that I sometimes give is um, what would an appropriate response be for Porirua on the climate emergency? So just looking at the basic, I guess, yeah, it's, that's as a place to start. But I, I definitely think it will require multiple assemblies and and a strategic <laughs> and for around the question. Right. Thank you. So Julie Cave has the first question go ahead go ahead julie and, and unmute yourself hi um yeah my question i'm talking about democracy um nikki hager was speaking at a 
Green Conference, Green Party meeting in Nelson recently, and he suggested that a major way to get democracy happening better would be if there was a cap on um, election funding, because lots of um, political parties are obviously getting funded by rich multinationals, and then they have to do what they say, basically. So he was, I think, suggesting that we start a massive campaign um, to have a low threshold of election funding for all parties. What do you think about that? Uh, I'll op open that to both speakers, but um, I'll go to Callie first since you, you were commenting particularly on failures mm -hmm. of democracy. Yeah, I think that would be great. I think we should also put a cap on how much people can profit in general. <laughs> yeah. To avoid some of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, my personal feeling is that our system is fundamentally broken, or it's not, it's not actually broken. It's working exactly as it's planned. And if we put these little band aids on the system, then um, we're going to still be fundamentally stuck with what we already no wasn't working so I actually think we need to be more dramatic than that but um it's a great idea thank you and May do you wish to comment on that question um I guess I'd just say yeah I think there's a lot of things um that are needed to make uh democracy in a way you know function in a way that's really equitable and meaningful and I think a lot of that comes down to um yeah where power and participation and decision making sits and so obviously there are lots of ways in which um certain groups um and wealthy and powerful groups and you know it's not nearly as bad here as I lived for a long time in the U.S. I can tell you some bad stories uh, but we definitely don't want to follow down the path of um from over there so I think that it's really important to have um, to focus our attention on these new ways of being with each other and making decisions and where we can devolve decision making, but then also to have these guardrails in place like, yes, caps on political donations, yes, things around revolving doors between corporate and political offices, yes, you know, transparency and scrutiny and participation around major decisions like infrastructure and spending so that they're not... Um, benefiting um certain people or interests so I mean I guess the big question is really how do you have a kind of community and person and 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 here technology focused democracy that's really working for people so I think that's a part of it but but I mean a bit like Callie you don't want to kind of fixate in a way on a technical solution to such a big complex kind of large scale adaptive change that we all need to be part of Thanks, May. Carl Horn from Westport, your question. Yes. Thank you. The question about climate change is global, not even just national. And no one seems to have, uh, the two speakers, thank you very much for all that information, have not mentioned the, the use of television. I vaguely remember that in Ireland, the meetings of the assemblies were broadcast nationally on television and had a very high uh, viewer um, population. Any comments about the use of that in such an important issue as climate change? Um, before, before Callie and May are invited to respond, can I broaden that question a bit? and ask about IT technologies in general applied to citizens assemblies, um, if, if you care to comment on that. And um, maybe we'll go to May first this time. Yeah, I mean, I think it goes to that point about thinking about the broader, um, you know, not thinking about an assembly as a, as a bounded thing or a closed exercise, but actually, how do you how do you use it to have much broader conversations? And so, yes, I think the Irish case is a really interesting um, example, and I think that is an example where um, 
it did have, like it was interesting, they did research in Ireland. Um, for example, um, you know, where you could see there's a big shift in people who knew about assemblies to actually how they and how they <laughs> engaged to how they ended up um, participating in those referenda. So it wasn't it wasn't just people who participated in the assembly, but it was actually people who knew about it and had heard about it. And so that's a part of it. I think there has been a big, um, obviously a lot of these processes have had to go online over the pandemic. Um, and um, I think the feeling in the field is that that you know, it's not impossible to do, but I think as we all know, there's also something very um, significant about building trust um, in person. Um, so obviously also possible to do that online and I'm sure, Kelly, you have some thoughts on this too, but, um, but I guess it's about, yeah, using whatever tools we have to do what needs to be done. Mm. Thanks, May. On to Kelly. If you wish, you don't feel obliged. Oh, do you know that? Yeah, no, that's it's a good question and something that I was thinking I was going to mention about. But yeah, you I, I think with the TV thing specifically, there's a um there's a, a harmony between being able to share the information with the general public at the same time as providing the privacy that um, makes people feel able to really participate from their from themselves, you know. But um, but you're right. I think yeah, it's really important. And in Ireland, I think they were specifically sharing the presentations, and this is another area of um, of huge strength in. Citizens Assemblies, as, as May was saying, you know, you will invite the people who disagree as well, and the assembly themselves can pick experts um, to come in, um, depending on how it's all running. So um, it's a really, really important tool in public education more broadly. And then, and TV is just one of them, though, because those people are also all going to go home to their families and speak to multiple people about what's going on. So there's kind of the really tangible sharing of information and then there's this tacit sharing of information which is just if not more powerful um and the other thing I was going to say so in regards to IT that Joanna was saying um I'm not an expert I don't I don't know a lot about um what other people what other groups have used um but I have used for a long time Lumio which is a local decision making platform I don't know if you know about that I mean it's global um, and has been incredibly successful in helping people to come to decisions together. Um, and I, yeah, I've sort of started some conversations with Lumio to see whether they would be interested in developing some of their, their existing kind of group decision-making stuff um, to do something like this, which would be pretty cool to use a local um, IT um, social enterprise. At the same time, don't want to reinvent the wheel, you know, like there's probably software that has been developed specifically for this. Um, the last thing that I wanted to say on in regards to that kind of like televising information and things is that there's it's really important, I believe, to to generate the um, awareness around this before it happens as well as after. I mean, one of the groups that I've been really inspired by is... Um, in Victoria as well, completely separate from the um, from the permanent work that is now embedded in council processes, um, the local mobs or the local um, indigenous people have been holding um, assemblies for to create a treaty in Victoria, and um, it's really really worth a look if you want to Google it. Like what they've been able to do is incredible. Um, but as they were advertising to their people to get involved and that this was happening and to people more broadly, um, they did things like they held concerts and um, they held um, design competitions where the design went onto a car that was then driving around the state of Victoria. <laughs> you know, like, there's lots of cool ways to um, to make people aware of what is happening. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. That's extremely interesting. Uh, let us go to Michael Diamond. 
Yeah, sure. I'll tell. Hopefully you can hear me okay. <clears throat> I've got a couple of points. I've, my reading tells me that um, greater in inequality often and usually brings civic apathy and distrust. I think we're seeing some evidence of that in the areas that have had you know, devastating floods and stuff. Uh, do our uh, speakers agree that that might be helped with uh, people's assemblies? The second point I would like to make is how can people's assembly incorporate and be built into the intentions of Tiriti, Tiriti Waitangi? Thank you. Okay. Um... Kelly, would you like to start that one off? Sure. Um, sorry, can you please just remind me the first part again, Michael? Um, my brain is fading here. No. The, that, that inequality brings oh, yeah. a civic apathy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of, I think it's, um, I definitely, I agree. I think the way that it's worded is is um, sort of insinuates that people become less active out of some mm. kind of choice. But I think I, I hear what you're saying because it's not, I don't believe that it's a choice. I think it's a result of being under-resourced and, and being mm. under pressure is that you just don't have the luxury of, um of time and energy and and to be able to commit to anything so it's um yeah i definitely think citizen assemblies will is is a way forward mm -hmm. um on that in, in terms of how to um i can't remember your words but i i sometimes would use the term embody tetriti within a citizens assembly I sort of I keep on using this language citizen assembly, but it's mostly just so that we all kind of understand each other generally. But I think it needs to be the opposite way around. We need to understand what CDT is saying, and then we build our assembly around that, as opposed to trying to tick box. You know that we've we've doing it here and there, and and fundamentally that means doing it with mana whenua and um and making sure that we are doing we are working in a way that is always um, um, approved is the wrong word, in collaboration with our treaty partners. Thank you, Kelly. May, do you wanna make any comments on either of those two questions? Um, I mean, I agree with everything Kelly's said. I think I'd say on the first one, I think there is, yeah, no time and energy, but also there is that, um, I think, increasing experience where people feel like those systems and processes aren't for them and that's their direct experience, right? So it's it's very well founded. Um, and so, um, yeah, as an exercise, along with other things, like, again, not a panacea, not a technical fix to kind of actually having um, a society of democracy that that where um, where people are not shut out um, and that does um, also as Cal is saying really respect and center Manafenua and and I think part part of the way in which the two things are connected is that you need to then operate as it sounds like um, Callie, the process Kelly is involved in, kind of at what I call like the speed of trust. So it can't be this kind of rushing in with a plan, with a, you know, here's the model that's going to fix everything. You know, it, it has to be such a, um, you know, to pay proper respect to, to actually um, embody that respect. It needs to build off being in real relationship um, listening and and giving credence and giving respect to decisions that are taken and then you know kind of following the path of where it leads you so I guess it's also not to get hung up too much on the form um, because the form will need to change for what is um, what is needed here and what follows um, follows the leadership of Mana here. Thanks mate. Alan Davis
Hello. Colin, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I was looking for my unmute. Um, yeah, may put on screen uh, something about capitalism and democracy and suggesting that they were incompatible, which I totally agree with. Um, considering that most of us, in fact, virtually all of us, are caught up in a totally capitalistic system, which is dragging us to the edge of disaster. And we're doing it really quite willingly, uh, aided and abetted by TV films and uh, advertising, of course. What I'm interested in is knowing from Cali particularly how the Citizen Assembly can start to challenge this dominance of capitalism, which seems to be leading us uh, to, to disaster, uh, where we need to change direction considerably. Mm. Well done. Yeah, I, the, um, that's a great question. I'd be interested in others' response as well. Um, I think mm, how it, I think it's about having a space for truth. You know, there's a there's got to be a place where we can be given access to all of the information and the main um, the tools that the advertising industry and what capitalism using is using is lies. You know, like that's basically advertisement is built on being allowed to contextualize to 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 put two different contexts together you know they sell something through adding this other context and um and yeah i think that the the antidote to that is going to be giving people free and supported access to information and then not it's not just the information itself which changes minds it's knowing how that information affects other people in your community and having a sense of shared responsibility to be able to make better decisions. And my personal belief is that if we create the environment for those conversations to be had, then the decisions coming out of these groups are just naturally going to move away from the things that are destroying us because it's not, yeah, we, we don't, I don't think we're a naturally suicidal species. I think that they, those are um, external external influences and once enough people are given the space to really realize how how serious the situation is but also that we are continually fueling it you know no pun intended <laughs> that's my hope anyway I hope that answers your question a little bit thank you thanks Kelly uh, let me just check May do you wish to comment yeah I was just going to add that I think it's also about people being in non-transactional relationship with each other. So about forming um, kind of relationships of real listening and understanding and, and operating, I think it's Callie saying, from those deep values and instincts that, um, you know, most of us have in terms of what we want, in terms of community and environment. And obviously a lot of the most damaging um, kind of dynamics in politics and society that we've seen are often about um, kind of encouraging people to pit groups against each other because it's politically expedient or because it's um, economically expedient. And, and I guess this is a space in which we can practice being in very different relationship with each other. And I guess I think a lot about, um, I don't know if others know the work of Adrienne Mary Brown from the Movement for Black Lives um, in the US and her work on emergent strategy and other things. And she talks about, um, she kind of draws a lot from 
um, nature in terms of how we then think about how change happens and what kind of change is possible. So she's also of the kind of Ursula Le Guin kind of um, uh, thinking about possibility. But one of the things she talks about is that we often talk about changing democracy at this big level, but if we think about change as a series of fractals, we often don't practice it on the smaller level. We don't necessarily practice doing it in our families, in our communities, in our organisations. And without that, we can't really, you know, it's this such a removed and kind of full of hubris idea that we can somehow structurally reform our way to a practice and a set of relationships that we don't even, we're not even practising with each other. And so for me, this is one site and one way practicing those things that we're hoping to demonstrate and also see start to imbue at different levels because people see and experience it. Thank you, May. <laughs> Last question goes to Jen O'Connell. Uh, kia ora. Um, my question is sparked by something that Kelly said about being a professional and not knowing what's going to happen and being okay with it. Um, I guess I see that as one of the hurdles, at least initially before people sort of see the result of a citizens assembly, is that most people are not really okay with that. And I guess just wondering if you had any strategies for bringing people along who might be a bit more afraid of going into a process that they don't know the outcome and don't sort of feel that control that people cling to. Yeah, I guess that's that's where I'm coming from. Mm. Good question. I'm not sure, to be honest. Um, yeah, I think I think there's quite a lot on offer. You know, I, I don't think that we're asking people to turn up to this because you know, and they're going to think it's a waste of their time. Um, but I, but I also think that there's like it's a real chicken egg situation. Like once we get a couple of examples off the ground, I think it will be a lot easier for people to see that oh, we are creating the outcome as we go along. Um, and the more binding the like the um, examples that May used, where I think was that one in Poland where they had a binding. Um, agreement with the city which is really rare but that kind of thing is a really big offer so people are actually probably more inclined to be involved because th that is a real outcome you know even though they don't know what the recommendation is going to be the fact that they are going to contribute to this like law change or to this policy policy shift that's um that's pretty massive and and yeah I don't know how I guess just um, talking to people with as much kind of passion and time as possible. Like I think in Porirua, for example, we're going to do door knocking, you know, we're kind of going to go old school campaigning and um, having conversations with people um, so that we can sort of either address their concerns or share in their excitement or whatever it might be. Um, but yeah, really, I think being really genuine about offering people a voice and for that to be an opportunity for them to represent their community is actually quite a big offering for a lot of people. Um, and we definitely want and aspire to making sure all of the financial supports are in place that um, people aren't losing out if they do participate as well. Thank you, Kelly. May, anything you want to add? I mean, yeah, just to say that, um, I think you can, yeah, tap into people's desire to be involved, especially if they see such a credible process to get to the ask. So it's not, you know, just one group that there are lots of people who've been involved in setting the kind of stage for this to happen. Um, and there's some interesting kind of stuff you can read about people's responses. Um, say if, you know, um, people who, those 225,000 people who got called in France and, you know, people talking about, well, yeah, I had kind of always worried about this. And then I was being, I had heard about the process and I was being asked to be a part of it. And, you know, you're tapping into quite a strong sense of kind of belonging and responsibility in the community, you know. And I think similarly, Kelly's saying about those conversations, there's ways of having conversations in community that are 
really action oriented that really do draw out on what people really care about and believe in that can be a real catalyst um you know for action so I think it's a leap of faith I'd say there's often um Jen you'll often find those concerns especially on the government side right in kind of agreeing to this like but what so we have to do something with that like what do we and and obviously especially if a process is more public and is on tv and is you know and is engaging more broadly then hopefully there's a good level of accountability um for action but certainly I think that's often probably a barrier on the government side to saying yes right is this isn't a process we can control and we can't just take these submissions and then massage what we're going to do anyway out of it so then there needs to be a kind of um enough visionary leadership um or enough pressure and push or both um to often get that you know across across the line Thank you, May. Uh, finally, Tewehi, um, I wonder if you might um, like to make some final comments on uh, what you've what you've heard tonight and your your own commentary on that. I have a page full, but I'll try, I'll try and narrow it down. Um, firstly, just thank you to both um, yourselves, um, May and Kelly. You both brought a mass amount of uh, of knowledge on this co-papa, and it was, you know, I wrote a page down, and I normally don't write anything. So um, <laughs> it goes back to what I said at the start. When we when we look at this, it's really hard to pinpoint one thing or or narrow it down because it's such a big thing. It's 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 about embodying society into a new decision making process, and there's so much comes with that. So um. Again, just really appreciate both of you and the, and the mahi that you've done to know the things that you know to then share it with us all. Um, I'm going to pick one thing out of my list of things, <laughs> and um, that is around Te Tiriti and what it offers. Um, so to me, that's a big part of what I do in, in addressing the climate crisis is understanding the role that Te Tiriti plays within that and understanding what our current power structures, the roles they play in one creating it, but and also what they the roles they play moving forward now. To be honest, I don't think I don't think their roles is that significant or that big, apart from the fact that they hold all the power currently. But um what Te Tiriti does for us as a people, as a community, as Māori, as Tanga Te Tiriti, is it lets us imagine a new way of decision making moving forward. Because like Kelly said, under Te Tiriti, our current parliament process is illegitimate because it's been founded on criminal activity, on land theft, on on lies, on manipulation, on all these, th all these things that when we look through the history of Aotearoa, we can really understand why it is we're in the place we're in. So when we're talking about honouring Te Tiriti, it's about saying we want something new, we want something that, that gives us a voice that gives everyone a voice that brings tikanga Māori back into our decision-making places, but it also holds legal legitimacy within an international framework, and that's where the power is. It's not this, it's not this imaginary concept, but it's a treaty that was signed by the Crown, and the Crown is our current political power holders, and they have there is power to that, <laughs> if you know what I mean. So, um, yeah. You know, so it's about really holding that and giving that power and through that, finding our own power. Um, uh, uh, when we talk about business as usual, and I'll just leave it here, we understand that business as usual, when we talk about capitalism, the patriarchy, white supremacy, all these things that come up. We talk about these things and business as usual. We understand that business as usual has to change. But for me, I believe that the only way we change business as usual is by changing power as usual. Because power as usual is what fuels business as usual. And Te Tiriti based people's assemblies, people's assemblies or citizens assemblies as a change of power as usual, because it's about giving power to, to people and devolve the spreading power out throughout a community. And for the last however many centuries, power has always been held by the few. So it's about flipping that on its head. So um, that's one of my thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> we we thank you very much, Tewehi, and uh, 
also for you for bringing the next generation briefly into in onto our screen. <laughs> that was also very delightful. This has been a very good conversation. Um, uh, it, very interesting to me that it ranged so broadly that that opening up the idea of of people's assemblies and deliberative democracy um, seemed to to open up so many questions of of democracy, equality, capitalism, um, and it, it is perhaps because we do seem to be on the brink of what many people are calling social transformation and, and other terms. And we are going to have difficult, complex, value-laden decisions to make. Uh, and Kelly and May, you've brought to us tonight a, a deeper understanding uh, of, of processes that, that seem like a very helpful pathway for us to follow. So thank you both very much for, for the work that you do in an ongoing way in this area and for bringing your, your knowledge and wisdom to us tonight. Many thanks. And I'll ask Tewehi to close us with the Karakia Mukunga. Um, thank you everyone for joining us tonight and to our two speakers Kelly and May again um, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week and um, peace and love to you all uh, kia hora te marino kia whakapapa pauna mi te moana hei huarahi mā tātou i te pōnei aroha atu, aroha mai tātou i a tātou katoa hau mi e hu i e tāhe kia tāhe kia Thanks, everyone. Uh -huh. Uh -huh.